Assalamu alaikum, everyone. I am once again Faraha Woodrub. I am a third year medical student. And for today, we will be starting the first post midterm uh, crash course for immunology. Our second part will, inshallah, be next week, also on Saturday, where we will be covering the rest of the lectures. As I was just mentioning, uh, the last three lectures, which are 13, 14, and 15, will not be covered in any of the crash courses, just because I feel like they don't necessarily need a session. However, if you guys do feel like they do, then please feel free to request that and we'll try our best to find a timing that works. Alternatively, we could have a review session where I go over all of the content, all of the most high yield details before your exam with practice questions as well. All right, without further ado, for today's session, we will be going over a quick revision over the pre-midterm material for the things that we need for those sessions. Then we will be going over lecture seven, lecture eight, and lecture nine. All right. So let's very quickly review things that we did last time. Once again, you guys are gonna get sick of me for this, but I really hope it does help you for your exam. We will get started with our characters, which we will be carrying along with us. First of all, we have those two brothers. One was a four-year-old, one was an eight-year-old. Those are our CD4 positive and CD8 positive T lymphocytes, okay? So the four-year-old loves to help his brother and his babysitter because he is our helper T cell. The eight-year-old always wants to protect his family and you can see he has his biceps, he's super strong because he is the cytotoxic T cell. Next up, we had our babysitter or our BC, which is our B cell or B lymphocyte. She's 19 years old. She constantly has a presentation due because she is a professional antigen presenting cell. She always alarms the boys about stranger danger because she presents the antigens to them and she always has a presentation due. Next up, we had our old man that was super, super anxious. He had crazy hair that makes him look like a neuron and that gives him his name of a dendritic cell. And he is the first responder to new faces. So he's also the one that constantly goes around and everyone asks him for advice. We also had our macrophage who was always super hungry. He was 14 years old and he likes to go to sleep or he sleepwalks unless he is eating, right? So he goes around as a, as a monocyte in the blood and then as he homes into tissue, he becomes a macrophage. He has multiple nicknames because he takes up different names depending on the site that he is in. Our B cell's best friend, our neutrophil was 15 years old. She had freckles, that is why she's called a granulocyte along with the rest of her family. Multiple bonds that increase when she's stressed. She's stressed because you guys can see here, our neutrophil has multiple lobes. And the more lobes that we have, our hypersegmented neutrophils indicate that we are recruiting more and more in the case of infection. And so it's a germaphobe that likes fishing because it detects bacterial cells and it forms nets. We had this very bashful, very blushing with granulocytes again. So it blushes pink and it's activated in seasonal allergies. This was our eosinophil. Next to our eosinophil, we had this character which has curly hair that is super sensitive. And this curly hair would just go all over the place. And this was our mast cell. You guys can see that it also has a bunch of granulocytes, but it's far more than any of the other two. So this is our granulocyte family. This is our 15 year old, our 14 year old. Is that all clear for you guys? Do you guys remember those characters well enough? All right, perfect. I might be going a bit too fast right now, but that's just because this is a review. So you guys already know this. I won't be going this fast later on, inshallah. Now, we also briefly discussed the topic of central tolerance, where we said that if a B cell that gets presented with an antigen either binds too strongly to the self-antigen or doesn't react at all, it gets negatively selected in order for it to go and get, let's say, recycled, where its B cell receptor is changed. And then if it binds properly, this is positive selection. We looked at our CD4 positive T cells and our CD8 positive T cells and how they interact with MHC. I told you guys that the product should always be eight. So one times eight is eight, two times four is eight. So MHC class two will be recognized by CD4 and MHC class one will be recognized by CD8. 
you guys can see that the T-cell receptor has this shape, which we will be talking about very soon, but you can see it has four subunits, right? Very similar to how we had our antigens that also kind of looked like they had antibodies, sorry, that kind of also looked like they had four subunits. So those are our CD4 positive and CD8 positive T cells and our B cell, which would introduce them to those types of antigens. All right, next up, we had the actual formation of the antibodies where we had DNA gene rearrangement. So it's within the genome. We had RAG1 and RAG2. Then we had random nucleotide insertions using TDT. After that, we had transcription into a precursor RNA and then splicing into mRNA. RAG1 and RAG2 had combinatorial diversity where they could combine different VD and J sequences. And TDT had junctional diversity where at the junctions between V, D, and J, they could randomly have missense mutations. They could insert and delete nucleotides, so on and so forth. And that is that for our revision. Any questions before we get started with the new lectures? You guys need to know those pretty well because I'm gonna be referencing a lot of those things again in the new lectures. All good? All right. All good, okay, perfect. So without further ado, let us get into our first lecture, which is thymic education, central tolerance, chemokines, and lymphocyte trafficking. This is a very long title, and the lecture, in my opinion, was very haphazard, like the things were not ordered well at all. So I changed up the order of some things, and uh, chemokines, I shifted to the next lecture altogether, but for explanation purposes, however, when I send you guys the presentation, I will probably put them back in lecture seven, just for the sake of completion, and so no one gets confused. Okay, so this is lecture seven. When we talk about the lymphatic system, when we talk about the immune system, we typically start referencing the fact that we have lymph nodes where our cells will be traveling to or homing in on or just resting in. So what is the immune system or what are lymphatics? The lymphatics are a drainage system for the removal of cellular debris and microbes from the body's tissues to the lymph nodes, as you guys can see here, okay? We have primary lymphoid organs where we mainly have the development of our T and B cells and that gives them their name. So thymus for T cells and bone marrow for B cells. And then we have our secondary lymphoid organs like the spleen and the lymph nodes. The liver in fetal life is our primary lymphoid organ, but as we grow older, it barely has any function at all, okay? So the function of the primary lymphoid organs are the regeneration and the maturation of precursor cells. And the secondary lymphoid organs are going to have the filtration of the debris from the lymph, and they're going to have concentrations of antigens for presentation by antigen presenting cells. Now, I've told you guys more than enough about the bone marrow when we were discussing the B cell development. However, for now, we will be focusing more on the thymus. So the thymus is a gland, and it's a small organ in front of the heart that is very active in early stages of life, and this is where we have our T-cell development. However, as someone grows older, the thymus gland becomes more fatty, and it kind of involutes, all right? So it's no longer very functional. By then, the person should have developed a complete T-cell repertoire, or basically this collection of T-cells that have already developed sufficiently. And this is why when you're a child, you should try to get exposed to as many antigens on, as possible in moderation, obviously don't go killing yourself, but you should get exposed to various different antigens so that you can get this huge T-cell repertoire, all right? These T cells within the thymus themselves are going to get exposed to various antigens, either on class one or class two MHD. So they are self molecules, self antigens. Like I told you guys about the central tolerance in B cells, the T cells are gonna have the exact same thing. And as they're developing, we will be calling them thymocytes because they are these cells of the thymus, okay? So thymocytes will get exposed to class one and class two MHC. What does that look like? If we were to take a cross-section of our thymus, you can see here we have the cortex and the medulla. We start in the cortex, and then as these thymocytes are developing, they will move gradually towards the medulla to eventually get secreted into the bloodstream. So 
the structures here include these thymocytes that as you guys can see. They include these stroma or epithelial cells, these interdigitating dendritic cells, as well as the macrophages for phagocytosis. These dendritic cells, I told you guys, we want to present MHD class one and two, we want to present self antigens. So the dendritic cells have a very important function in that. They will be the ones to actually present the antigens to our thymocytes. The macrophages will phagocytize the dead or the defective thymocytes that don't pass through this central tolerance. The stroma and the epithelial cells are going to produce growth factors, which will enable those thymocytes to proliferate more, and they will enable them to basically continue their growth and their differentiation. Okay, so these T lymphocyte precursors, or these thymocytes, much like B cell precursors, are going to begin to undergo VDJ recombination to their T cell receptor. And they're going to, as I told you guys, pass from the cortex to the medulla as they do so, as they do so. Okay. So at this stage, these cells are not expressing any kind of CD marker. Do you guys remember what was the common CD marker that I told you guys all T cells have? CD3, yes, perfect. So someone said CD8. CD8 is specific for our cytotoxic T cells. So CD4 uh, T cells should not have CD8. However, both of them should express CD3. You guys remember what other cell is CD3 positive, but is not directly a lymphocyte? Natural killing cells. Yes, perfect. Great job. D helper cells are also 3D, uh, CD3 positive. Yes, good job. All right, but C, uh, T helper cells are lymphocytes. Okay, so at this stage, we don't have the expression of any of these. We don't have CD3, we don't have CD4, we don't have CD8, but they are undergoing genetic programming to start arranging their VDJ segments. Is that clear for everyone so far? All right. Moving on, you guys, is this is exactly what I was just talking about. You can see that at the cortex, we will have the VDJ arrangement. And these cells will not express CD4, CD3, or CD8. So they are double negative thymocytes. What does that mean? What that means is that we basically don't have either CD4 or CD8, so they're not specific whatsoever. However, as they move towards the medulla, they gain CD3 expression. So, okay, now we know that these are lymphocytes. They are T lymphocytes, right? But they start to express both CD4 and CD8. So because of that, they're able to recognize both class 1 and class 2 MHC. And this makes them double positive T cells. So they're responsible to, uh, they're responsive, sorry, to two phosphorylation signals, which means that if I'm presenting an antigen on MHC class 2, I will react using my CD4. And if I'm presenting on MHC class 1, I will react using my CD8. But we know that our T lymphocytes don't express both, and thus they will go through this process of differentiation where they get presented with both MHC class one and MHC class two. However, the one they bind to more strongly is the one that they are going to differentiate into. So let's say that a cell that is double positive will bind more strongly to MHC class two. What is it going to differentiate into? CD4, exactly. And the opposite is also true. If it binds more strongly to MHC class one, it is going to become a CD8 positive T cell, so a cytotoxic T cell. The other CD is just going to become dormant. It's, it's going to get destroyed. It's not going to work anymore. And this gives us our single positive naive T cell. So why am I saying naive? Although I told you guys that they have differentiated into CD4 and CD8. Well, that's because they have not yet gotten introduced to any antigens. The same happened for our B cells. Remember when I told you that we have 
a completely developed and yet immature, naive B cell, and it's going to circulate until it meets its antigen, and then its antibody will differentiate properly to become a plasma cell, right? So here in the thymus, we still have naive T cells that are specific to CD4 or CD8 and that do express CD3, but they have not yet been exposed to an antigen. Clear? So it only saw the MHC, but not the actual antigen. Well, it's not necessarily that you detect MHC itself. It's rather that you're detecting the self-antigen presented on the MHC class. So I told you guys we have the dendritic cells that are going to be there in interdigitating, right, in the thymus. They will present self-antigens on MHC class 1 or class 2. And then depending on which one the T cell is going to respond more to, that is the one it's going to differentiate into. But it's not necessarily the MHC itself. The MHC is, is always there. Okay, perfect. So taking a closer look at our T cell receptor, you guys, I told you had, like it had those four subunits, right? You can also see it here with its four subunits. Looking at MHC class two, I told you guys it passes through the membrane twice and that's an easy way to remember that it's two and it's going to have its alpha and beta subunits. And then here we have CD4, which interacts with it. But our T cell receptor itself needs to also have its own specificity, right? It needs to also be very specific to its antigen. Do you guys remember what the region was in our antibodies for B cells that were specific to antigens? The hypervariable regions, do you guys remember what those were? Okay, FC region is what determines the class, the isotype of the antibody that we have. CDR, yes, perfect. So our CDR were those, you guys remember, like they had those finger-like projections on the outside that would mold to the shape of our antigen. And they were in our hypervariable region and they caused this huge array that we had. You have those CDR regions as well in your T cell receptor, specifically in those subunits here. Okay, so you have an alpha and a beta chain in 95% of T cells. In 5% of T cells, they're going to be a subset that have gamma and delta instead, but those aren't something that you guys have to focus on right now at all. It, they're basically this fusion between an innate and an adaptive immune response. Okay? So I'm telling you guys that they undergo VDJ recombination. They have those CDR regions where they respond to the antigen. What's the difference between them and the B cell receptor then? They look almost exactly the same. They, they seem like they're exactly the same. The difference is, which I told you guys in the previous session, is that the B cell receptor that is essentially an antibody can recognize natural unprocessed epitopes of the complete antigen. But a T cell receptor's antigenic peptide needs to be processed and presented on class one or class two MHC of a professional antigen presenting cell. What do those include? Once again, our macrophages, our dendritic cells, and our B cells. Is that clear for everyone? All right, perfect. Okay. So once we have this T cell receptor that is recognizing MHC class one or MHC class two, and we have developed this VDJ and we have become specific to either one or two, we need to differentiate into one or the other cell type, right? So this brings us once again to central tolerance. I will very briefly discuss it again. And this is basically eliminating T cells that are non-functional if they are defective or if they have a non-functional T cell receptor. So the naive T cells in the T lymphocytes, as I told you guys, have not been exposed to an antigen before, and they require activation by professional antigen presenting cells. So during their development within the thymus, the dendritic cells are going to show them self-antigen. This is important, self-antigen. They're not showing them bacteria or they're not showing them something that is foreign because the thymus is a sterile organ. It's not supposed to expose those thymocytes to anything that is foreign or a pathogen. It's showing them self-antigen. If this T cell 
receptor is going to bind way too strongly to the self antigen, destroying the dendritic cell. This is harmful. This can cause us an autoimmune reaction. So this is called negative selection. We will destroy this type of T cell. If the T cell is not responding whatsoever to anything, you're showing it a self antigen, you're showing it MHC class one, MHC class two, it's, it's not responding whatsoever, you'll just simply neglect the T cell because it's defective, right? But it's not going to cause any harm. It's not going to like break down your cells and it's not going to cause an autoimmune reaction. So you just don't need it. If a T cell receptor binds to an antigen presenting cell, it binds to the self antigen sufficiently, but not strong enough to kill it, this leads to positive selection where we realize and recognize the C-cell as, okay, yes, you are doing a good job. You recognize that there is an antigen being presented, but you do also recognize that this antigen is not one that you have to destroy. So in this case, we have positive selection of that T-cell. We don't destroy it, and it's actually ready to become a naive T-cell that can be released and can emerge from the thymus. Clear? All right, so I keep on telling you guys a naive T cell, a naive T cell, how do we become an effector T cell? Effector T cells are basically the T cells that have been exposed to antigen before and are in a pre-activated state. So they're kind of similar to memory B cells that we had, where if they get reactivated again, they're already ready to go. They can become plasma cells immediately. And how that happens is through various different ways. The first one we will be discussing is called the parenteral root. The parenteral root is basically when a person gets exposed to an antigen that is extracellular, and then a dendritic cell that is within the vicinity here. So let's say that someone steps on a nail, okay? This is a rusty nail that is laden with bacteria. This bacteria penetrates the skin. The dendritic cells within the skin here are going to pick up this antigenic bacteria, they're going to pick up this antigen and they will travel all the way to the nearest draining lymph node, okay? As they do that, they will undergo what is called a chemokine receptor switching. And what that does is basically, instead of the dendritic cell remaining stationary in the skin, it will be able to migrate to the lymph node. It stays there in the lymph node waiting for a T lymphocyte to come to it. It's like, oh, this is the moment. Come on, guys. It's, it's about to happen. The T cell is going to come. I'm going to change this from a naive T cell to an effector T cell because it's the super monumental, super important to, moment, right? Meanwhile, our T lymphocytes are going to be circulating in the blood. They've emerged from the thymus. They are ready to go. They're just looking for something. They're trying to hunt something down. They're circulating in the blood going from one lymph node to the next, basically asking the lymph node, do you have anything that you'd like to present for me, right? They're very eager. And when they reach this lymph node, they'll actually see this antigen that is getting presented on the dendritic cell. Once that happens, if it's a cytotoxic T cell, it is going to immediately destroy that cell. And if it's a T helper cell, it will recruit macrophages in order to do the job for it. And we'll be talking a lot more about that very soon, okay? So I mentioned to you guys that we have chemokine receptor switching when we move the dendritic cells from skin to the lymphocyte. That also happens in T cells, but in the opposite direction, where instead of the T cells doing immune surveillancing going around the body, they will undergo a class switching and they will home to a specific lymph node. And they will stay there and they will fight the infection. So they'll attach to the antigenic epitope presented on MHC. They'll proliferate to basically recruit more T lymphocytes to the site. They will mature because now they are effector T cells and they will undergo this chemokine receptor switch. Okay. Clear. So after, okay, is that just so I'd wait and not move to the slide? Okay, so after, yes. So after that, they are no longer naive, yes. So after they are 
presented with an actual antigen from an antigen presenting cell, they are no longer naive. In the next lecture, we will be talking in details about how they no longer become naive and how they become effector T cells and what that interaction actually looks like on a much smaller scale. So we'll get to that. But for now, what you guys need to know is that antigen presenting cells shows the antigen, the T cell sees the antigen, responds to it, and it becomes an effector T cell. It's no longer a naive T cell. Sure thing. Okay. Now in this case, the opposite sort of happens where we have a dendritic cell that has picked up the bacterial or the viral antigen. It presents it on MHC class two to CD4 naive T helper cells within the lymph node or to CD, uh, CD8 T, T cytotoxic T cells on MHC class one, also within the lymph node. And then this T cell is going to change from a naive T cell to an effector T cell because it has been exposed to the antigen. And it undergoes once again a chemokine receptor change. But in this case, rather than it homing into the lymph node, it will be surveillance again to the site of the infection, okay? So let me explain that again. How does this happen? Dendritic cell comes, presents the T lymphocytes. I'm sorry, guys, just a second. Sorry about that, okay. So we have our dendritic cell producing or showing this antigen in the lymph node itself. After that, a CD8 positive or our CD4 positive is going to recognize that antigen, become a mature effector T cell, and then it's going to undergo a chemokine receptor change whereby it gets attracted, let's say, to the site of action. It gets attracted to where we had, in this case, the nail going in, right? This is where we actually have the infection. This is where we actually have the issue. So those T cells are going to get recruited to the site. They're going to go there, and that is where they will perform their activity rather than just within the lymph node itself. Is that clear? Okay, perfect. All right, now we have antigen presentation in two contexts, either to a naive T cell that is going to see an antigen presenting on a professional antigen presenting cell in the lymph node or the spleen, and then although these naive T cells see the antigen on the MHC, I told you guys there are other receptor interactions that need to be done before the naive T cell becomes an effector T cell. However, once they do become effector T cell, they're going to see the antigens on the target cells like the bacteria or the virus. And then you're going to have an effector T cell that moves out of the lymph node or the spleen directly to the tissues to attack the antigen that was active as a naive T cell. So all it needs to do is see this antigen, become an effector T cell, go to the site, and then destroy it. How that happens is that if it is a T helper cell, it will release inflammatory cytokines. And if it is a cytotoxic T cell, it will recognize the antigen on class 1 MHC and directly kill that cell to prevent any more viruses to be made. Okay? The other aspect is that in order for a cytotoxic T cell to see antigen from an antigen presenting cell, the source of the antigen has to be internal, right? Like in a virus infected cell. But I told you guys that usually the ones that present this are our dendritic cells. And every virus will not somehow always infect a dendritic cell. They might infect other types of cells. So do you guys remember how the dendritic cells were still able to present on MHC class 1 for the cytotoxic T cells? Remember the grandpa? that everyone goes to for advice. Okay, so we have this cross presentation. Cross presentation is basically where the dendritic cell is going to phagocytose a whole virus infected epithelial cell. It's going to then process 
those antigens and present them on both class 1 and class 2 MHC. This can also happen within the lymph node. It can happen anywhere. So it's not any different to anything that we've been talking about so far. Does that ring a bell? Is that clear? Does that make sense? Okay. Do you want me to repeat just this or go over everything again? We could very briefly repeat the whole process if you'd like so that it's a, it's a clearer picture. Very, very quickly. So you get a bacteria, it penetrates the skin, right? The skin is our first barrier. It penetrates the skin. A dendritic cell in the vicinity is going to pick up this antigen. It undergoes a chemokine uh, class switch where it's going to migrate to the nearest draining lymph node. T lymphocytes that are still naive are going to be immune surveillancing. They're going around in the circulation. They will come to this lymphocyte and they will get presented with an antigen on those dendritic cells. As that happens, if it's presented on MHC class one, we will activate our CD8 positive T cells. If it's presented on MHC class two, we will activate our CD4 positive T cells. Both of those will undergo a chemokine class switching or receptor switching as well, and they will migrate to the tissue that is affected, and that is where they will undergo their action. A CD4 positive T cell is going to basically release pro-inflammatory or inflammatory cytokines, and a CD8 positive is going to actually kill that cell. Within the lymph node itself, they will kill that antigen that is getting presented on the dendritic cell, they will migrate, they will mature, so on and so forth. Now, the next point that I was talking about is that when we have a viral antigen, this is usually an intracellular sort of presentation, right? And in order for us to present on MHC class one, I told you guys that we typically do that on a dendritic cell. So a dendritic cell is going to present both MHC class one and MHC class two. However, not every virus is going to infect a dendritic cell. This virus might infect the epithelium, this virus might infect the connective tissue, this virus might go anywhere, right? It can go, it can penetrate whatever, it can infect whatever it wants to. It's not always going to penetrate or infect a dendritic cell. So infected cells that have this virus are going to get phagocytized, the entire cell, not just the virus, they will get phagocytosed or phagocytized. And these antigens, these viral antigens, will then get processed and presented on both MHC class 1 and MHC class 2. So in the previous example, I was telling you guys about a bacterial infection. But in this case, we are talking about a viral infection where it's intracellular. And because you present on both MHC class 1 and MHC class 2, you will activate both CD8 positive and CD4 positive. This entire process where we have this dendritic cell phagocytosing this virus-infected cell, the cell itself, not just the antigen, is called cross-presentation. And this is what I was telling you guys about in a previous session where I told you that when we want to present on MHC class 1, if the, the dendritic cell isn't the one that's affected, everyone goes to it for advice, right? So that cell that is infected will basically start sending out and releasing damps or damage-associated molecular patterns. Once it does that, the dendritic cell can kind of sniff out that, okay, we have something going on, we have an issue. It will travel towards that cell that is secreting those damps, and it will phagocytose it as a whole. After that, it will present on MHC class 1 and MHC class 2, and this is called cross-presentation. Is that clear now? Not necessarily only in viral infections, but in intracellular infections. And what do I mean by an intracellular infection? It could also be a cancer, for example. So the dendritic cell might also phagocytose an entire cancerous cell and then present on MHC class one and two. Is that clear for everyone? Does that make sense? Is there anything you'd like me to repeat? Because we are at the end of the first lecture. There's also 
I told you guys the, the chemokine portion, but I've included that in the next lecture because I did not feel like it fit in the best here without the context of the next lecture. So do you guys have any questions at all for me about this lecture? Was it clear? Is everything... Go for it, just to clarify, yes. Am I going too fast? Would you guys like me to go a bit slower? Does dendritic cell presenting both classes MHC class one and MHC class two mean cross presentation? Not necessarily because it can be something that infected the dendritic cell itself, or it can be the dendritic cell just having a defect and presenting on MHC class one and MHC class two. So cross-presentation basically refers to a dendritic cell that is presenting something that did not necessarily infect it or is defective in it. So the virus did not infect the dendritic cell. It infected another cell. But the dendritic cell is the one doing the presentation. So it's cross-presenting. So T cell can only recognize antigen on antigen presenting cells, yes. T cells cannot recognize any antigen unless it has been processed and presented on either MHC class one or MHC class two, unlike our B cells. Is that clear for everyone? I told you guys I, I don't like the order of the lecture, it doesn't really, like the flow doesn't work very well. So I'm sorry if it was somewhat confusing. If there's anything you'd like me to repeat again, I am more than happy to do so. This is your time to shine if you have any other questions. All clear, okay. Is everyone on the same page? Is everything clear? Perfect, okay. Now this next lecture, I'm not saying this to scare you guys, but just as a warning, is one of the heaviest lectures in immuno. And it's not necessarily difficult, it's just content heavy. There's a lot to cover. And I tried my best to give it to you guys in a very systematic way where we will be going through each step. And then I have a bunch of summary tables and like a couple of things to help you guys and diagrams to hopefully make this as clear as possible. But I would really appreciate if you guys focus with me as much as you can so that we can try to deliver this in the easiest way possible. So it's not difficult. It's just a lot of information. Okay, so buckle up. This is lecture eight. T cell regulation and co simulation cytokines. This is a very, very high yield lecture. Okay? Very. Did I emphasize that enough? Okay. When I told you guys that an antigen presenting cell will present an antigen to a T cell and then that naive T cell will become an effector T cell just because it sees an antigen, I told you that we have a lot more going on behind the scenes that actually makes all of this happen. So in this lecture, we will be looking at exactly what happens. In order for us to activate a naive T cell to becoming an effector T cell, we need four main steps. First of all, antigen recognition on MHC recognized by the T cell receptor, which is what I told you guys about. So CD4 will recognize on MHC class two and CD8 on MHC class one. Next, we will have a co-stimulation. Afterwards, we will have adhesion. And finally, we will have cytokine production. Seems relatively simple enough, but let, let's look at that in more detail. So step one is our first signal, and that is stimulation. This occurs between the MHC and the T cell receptor. 
As a result of engagement of the antigenic peptides, the CD3 complex will generate phosphorylation signals into the nucleus of the T cell, making it release cytokines to proliferate, okay? So once that happens, once we have this first signal, we will induce proliferation using CD3. This proliferation will recruit more T cells to the site. This will give us a more heightened immune response and this will kickstart the cascade, okay? Step two is where we have our second signal and this is co-stimulation or co-simulation. Our co-simulation happens using this fellow right here that you guys can see. We have our CD28 on our T cell and our B7 on our antigen presenting cell. This B7 also has two names, CD80 and CD86. CD80 is mainly expressed in B cells. CD86 is present on B cells, macrophages, and dendritic cells. So CD80 is usually called B7.1, and CD86 is B7.2. But if, if you're referring to either one of them, you can just, for simplicity's sake, say B7, and then you'd understand that it is CD80, CD86. So this B7 acts as a co-stimulator. It interacts with CD28 in order for us to have the actual immune response. If we don't have B7, we will not have this naive T cell becoming an effector T cell. So B7 is only ever expressed in infections. B7, which is CD80, CD86, is only ever expressed when we have something wrong. The CD28 will go sniffing around looking for a B7, but if it does not find it, even if it attaches to MHC, it will simply not become an effector T cell. Is that clear for everyone so far? Okay. All right. Now, once again, looking at our co-simulation, aside from just B7, which you guys can see here, we have what is known as CD40. Think of CD40 as kind of like the simulator of the simulator. So if we don't have CD40, we will not have B7. And if we don't have B7, we will not have an effector T cell. So this entire thing is a cascade, everything, will fall into the next. So a CD40 is going to get expressed, okay, on the antigen presenting cell. The CD40 ligand on our T cell is going to bind to the CD40. Once this happens, we will have the expression of B7, which will bind to CD28. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's say that again, because it sounds like a bit of jargon. So in the first instance, as a result of T cell receptor, seeing an antigenic peptide presented on MHC, a signal is delivered into the nucleus of the T cell by CD3, which causes it to proliferate and also express CD40 ligand. CD40 ligand is going to interact with CD40 on our antigen presenting cell. This drives the antigen presenting cell to start to secrete cytokines. What are these? We will be discussing them very shortly, inshallah. As a result of the activation through the antigen recognition of the T cell, the T cell will also express a cytokine receptor, okay? This CD40, CD40 ligand complex is going to stimulate the expression of B7, all right? So B7 will be expressed, it will engage with CD28, and this allows for the full exposure of our cytokines. So antigen presentation on MHC, post-stimulation and CD40 ligand, which leads to cytokine release, allow the naive T cell to proliferate and become a fully functional activated effector cell.
Does that make sense? CD40 is on the antigen presenting cells. CD40 ligand is on the T cell. Is that clear for everyone? So once again, let's just look at that in a diagram. Here, we will have the T cell receptor with its CD4. Okay, let's consider this a naive T helper cell. We have T cell receptor, CD4. To recognize it that, that this is MHC class two, it's like, okay, I can, I can interact with this. The antigen binds, CD3 is going to send proliferative signals to the nucleus where it's going to tell the T cell, okay, start proliferating. At the same time, it is going to tell it to express CD4, uh, CD4, CD4T ligand. The CD4T ligand is going to bind to our CD40. This CD40 will stimulate the antigen presenting cell to express B7. B7 expression, mind you, once again, is only ever going to happen when this antigen presenting cell actually phagocytizes or phagocytosis and microbial pathogen or there's some sort of infection, all right? B7, looking at that here again, B7, which is our CD80, CD86, will interact with CD28, okay? So, T cell receptor interacts with MHC. CD24 interacts with CD80, CD86, and then CD40 interacts with CD40 ligand. Is that clear for everyone? Okay, perfect. Wonderful, all right. So I told you guys about the co-simulation. What was the next step? So we had, first of all, MHC, second of all, co-simulation. What was our third step? Adhesion, perfect. Before we move on to adhesion, there was one thing that I did not mention to you guys, which is the name of what happens when we don't have B7. So when we stimulate this naive T helper cell using the MHC, I told you guys that even if it does recognize the antigen on MHC, if B7 is not there, the T cell will simply not react. That process where the T cell does not react due to lack of B7 is called energy. So think of it as the lack of energy of the T cell. So it's energy. Now, our next step, as you guys very rightfully said, is adhesion. Adhesion happens in the form of adhesion molecules, which are integrins. Integrins are a family of adhesion molecules that transmit a signal between a cell and its environment. And they are involved in T cell activation and lymphocyte homing. Now, what is homing that I mentioned to you guys? I kept saying homing into a lymphocyte, homing into a lymph node, homing into, homing into. So homing is basically when we have something that decides, okay, this is my home now. That's the very simple way of thinking about it. The T lymphocyte is doing this immune surveillancing. It reaches a lymphocyte that is actually infected. It does homing. So it sits there. It's like, okay, this is where I need to be. This is where I belong. And it realizes, okay, this is where I, I should stay. This happens through the adhesion or basically like this glue that keeps it in place using LFA1 and ICAM1. LFA1 is expressed on T cells and it binds very strongly to ICAM1 on antigen presenting cells. When this happens, I want you guys to sort of think about it as this barrier. So due to this very tight adhesion, it makes the cytokines that are being released from those macrophages, those dendritic cells, whatever the antigen presenting cell is, it makes those cytokines a lot more specific to the T cell. Because I don't want you guys to think that, oh, cytokines are just those small molecules, no, they can have very, very grave consequences and very grave effects. Cytokines, which we'll be discussing very shortly, 
if they spread all over the body, they might cause you an issue. So through adhesion, we ensure that the cytokines are mainly going towards where we want them to. And then afterwards, which is very counterproductive, we will be secreting them everywhere. But for now, we want to contain them. So naive T cells are moving out of the thymus, going through the lymphatics from one lymph node to another, sniffing out the antigen on dendritic cells. If they don't see the respective antigen that they were designed for, they will move to another dendritic cell. But if they do see the respective antigen that they are specific for, they will upregulate their adhesion molecules. And this allows the responder T cell to stick more tightly to the antigen presenting cell so that the T cell gets delivered the full body of co-stimulation so that we have all of those cytokines being released straight into it. Okay. So we have our lymphocyte function associated antigen or LFA1 that is expressed on our T cell and it's going to bind to the intracellular cell adhesion molecule ICAM1. You guys don't have to remember the full name, just know LFA1 will bind to ICAM1. This is also very prevalent in pathology where you have ICAM and VCAM and you're going to have Dr. Abrar doing the whole finger thing where he does a triangle and then it opens up and it's high affinity state. So you do have to remember ICAM specifically, all right? So, so far we've had a bunch of different reactions, right? We've had our CD4 receptor interacting with MHC class two. We've had our CD28 interacting with CD80, CD86. We've had our CD40 ligand interacting with CD40. And now we have our LFA1 interacting with ICAM1. Is that clear for everyone? Perfect, okay. Now the good news is that activated T cells don't require co-stimulation. So this was a nice drawing that Dr. Garwin put for you guys. We didn't get this, but I felt like it was cute, so I included it. Antigen presentation to a naive T cell needs co-stimulation, but antigen presentation to an effector T cell does not need co-stimulation. So after this becomes an effector T cell, it no longer needs all of those co-stimulatory molecules. It no longer needs all of those co-stimulatory signals that we saw in our B7 and our CD40. It does not need any of those. It simply needs to see MHC, recognize it, and undergo its functions. All right? So a CD8 positive will just directly kill the cell. A CD4 positive will just directly make its cytokines. But because that happens, we need to have something that can sort of control it because we don't want our immune system to run a blaze. We really don't want to have everything going all over the place. It makes things very, very difficult for the body. It can have an autoimmune sort of reaction. And now as you guys progress more towards clinical subjects, you will see that almost every time anything autoimmune is mentioned, they're like, well, we don't really know what goes wrong but something goes wrong. And if they don't know what the pathogenesis of a disease is, they will likely say, oh, it's autoimmune. So we need to have very close regulation. And our down regulatory signals in this case are going to be in the form of CTLA-4 and PD-1. CTLA-4 is going to be expressed on the T cell instead of CD-28. Now, once the antigen load has been reduced and the infection has been dealt with, there has to be a mechanism for winding down that activated immune response, as I told you guys. If we don't do that, we will have chronic inflammation. So expression of B7 co-stimulators is regulated and it ensures that the T lymphocyte responses are initiated only when needed. CD28 signals, which are what we had interacting with our CD80, CD86, or our B7, work in cooperation with T cell receptor signaling to promote cell survival, proliferation, and activation of specific T cells. So after the infection has been dealt with, most of these activated T cells will start to die off through apoptosis. But some of them 
will remain in the body for the rest of a person's life as memory cells. So think of how we had B lymphocytes that also became memory cells. And these memory cells, as I told you guys, do not require this coactivation anymore or those co-stimulation. Now, the way that these cells will die is by basically replacing or downregulating the CD28 with our CTLA4, all right? So the CTLA4 will begin to bind instead of our CD28 to our CD80, CD86, which is also our B7. In the later stages of the immune response, the CTLA4 is going to compete with CD28, and it will basically remove the B7 from antigen-presenting cells to prevent further lymphocyte stimulation. PD-1 is another system of downregulation, and it's basically expressed on the receptor T cell, and then a PD-1 ligand is expressed on the target cells and the antigen-presenting cells. When PD-1 and PD-1 ligand bind, this leads to death of the lymphocyte by apoptosis, okay, not of the cell. Because if we kill the cell, that is the function of a T cell anyway, so we're not really doing much. But binding PD-1 to PD-1 ligand is going to kill this T cell by apoptosis. Now, this mechanism is very frequently used and abused by viruses and by cancer cells. Well, they will start to express this PD-1 ligand in excess. And what that does is that you basically cannot stimulate an immune response because all the T cells are going to come with their PD-1. They're going to bind to the PD-1 ligand and realize, oh, OK, this is a, like I, I should not mess with the cell. This is something that I should step away from. I, I will simply die. Very Gen Z of it. So. Cancer cells and virus, uh, virus infected cells are going to express PD-1 ligand in excess. And then when we want to downregulate the signal of a T cell, we will also express PD-1 ligand. Same as for CTLA-4, but in this case, CTLA-4 stops the presentation of B7 rather than killing the actual T cell. Is that clear for everyone? All right, perfect. I think it stopped sharing my screen. Just a second. Okay, can you guys see my screen again now? All right, perfect. Okay. So I just mentioned to you guys a bunch of things, and I know it's a lot to handle, it's a lot to take in. So as I told you, as I promised, I've made this table that includes everything that we just talked about. Those are what's going to be expressed on the T cell, and those are going to be expressed on the antigen presenting cell. And once they interact, they will perform this function. So let's review that very quickly. And I want you guys to review it with me, okay? We have our T cell receptor or our TCR. It will interact with MHC, either class one for CD8 positive or class two for CD4 positive. And once this happens, we simulate the entire cascade, right? We recognize the antigen. We're like, oh, something is wrong here. If we don't recognize anything on MHC, then nothing even happens because we don't think anything's going on. After that, we're going to adhere very tightly to the cell using LFA1 on the T cell and through ICAM1 on the antigen presenting cell. Once that happens, CD40 ligand on the T cell will get co-expressed by the stimulation of CD4 to the nucleus along with proliferation, and it will interact with CD40 on antigen presenting cells. This leads to the expression of B7 on antigen presenting cells when we have an actual infection. CD28 on our T cell will then interact with that B7, which is also our CD80, CD86, to upregulate the T cell response. 
CTLA-4 and PD-1 act to downregulate the T-cell response, and CTLA-4 will basically compete with CD28 to bind to B7, while PD-1 will interact with PD-1 ligand, and this will downregulate the T-cell response by apoptosis. Is that clear now? Okay, very glad to hear that. All right, I told you guys, once again, let's go back to that. Four things we need. We said we have MHC, we have co-stimulation, we have adhesion. What was the last one? Cytokines, perfect. So that brings us to our cytokines. Cytokines are something that I've been mentioning to you guys consistently. I'm telling you cytokines and chemokines, which basically are chemoattractants that will attract the cells to the site, but they also have so many different functions. And in immuno, it is very important to understand what each, each cytokine does, when it's released, why it's released, and then correlate that with the presentation that you have in your patient. These cytokines are also super important in pathology, and they are something that you will continue to mention even in third year and onwards. So cytokines are a group of proteins that are produced by different cell types that mediate and regulate innate and adaptive immunity. They can be pro-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory, or both. So everything about cytokines depends on the time and the context. Many of these cytokines work in a cascade effect, similar to complements, where if you have one cytokine, it's going to stimulate another cytokine, or stimulates another cytokine, and you have this cascade. Now, cytokines do not have a very long duration of action. Some of them can be made de novo, or they can be sequestered as inactive zymogens. Do you guys remember what zymogens are? What IL-1 and IL-18 were? You remember what they were used for? No, I love the straightforward answer. Like I'd rather you guys told me that than had no reply. Okay, exactly the inflammasome. So when we had zymogens, which are basically our pre-proteins, they're not fully like effective yet. They're not ready to act yet. They need to be broken down or like part of them needs to be spliced off in order for them to work. These zymogens, specifically interleukin-1 and interleukin-18, will become effective using an inflammasome. An inflammasome is the he helicopter-looking thing that was a bunch of aggregated nod-like receptors or NLRs where they will have this activity on releasing these zymogens, interleukin-1 and 18, to become active cytokines. Does that ring a bell at all? I didn't put that slide in the review. That one specifically because I wanted to see if you guys would remember it or not. All right. Now, cytokines can be made by most cell populations. I'm not going to say all, but a lot of them. But the main producers are our T helper cells, our macrophages, dendritic cells, and natural killer cells. So. These two are our antigen-presenting cells. They will stimulate our T helper cells, and then our T helper cells might go to the natural killer cells and tell them, oh, look at me, I'm also a bodybuilder now. Ha ha. Okay. Cytokines have multiple properties, but within cytokines themselves, they might have what is known as pleiotropic, where a single cytokine can act on different cell types to have different effects. And this gets a bit confusing, but generally, thankfully, most cytokines have one type of effect. However, each cytokine does not produce a unique effect. You might have multiple cytokines that have the same effects. They might share receptors. They might even like share basically everything, like the, the signaling pathway and everything. So they can be a bit redundant where you have Specifically, let's talk about interleukin-1 and 6, let's say. They will both be inflammatory cytokines, but they both produce the same function on the same types of cells. They share the receptors, but 
It's, it's just redundant. Antagonism is something that those three terms at the end are all things that you guys have taken in pharma. An antagonistic effect is basically something that opposes the effect of something else, right? So when you're giving a muscarinic antagonist, when you're giving um, like an agonist, it, it just either opposes or makes something stronger or stimulates. So an antagonist is basically when we have one cytokine that opposes the effect of another cytokine. An additive effect is when one plus one equals two. Very simple. Two cytokines have similar effects. When they're added together, they give an increased effect, but it's summative. So it's exactly just both of their efforts together. A synergistic effect, on the other hand, is when, when two cytokines are brought together, they give me a lot more than just their signals separately or just their signals together. So when they're mixed, it's one plus one equals 10. So it's a huge synergistic effect. Now, as for their properties, they can do just about anything. They can act as growth factors. They can promote differentiation of immature cells. They can do basically anything. They can activate the B cells to make antibodies. They can activate the B cells to undergo isotype switching from IgM to IgG, which I told you guys we'll be talking about later, and it will be going over it in lecture 10, inshallah. Certain cytokines, specifically TNF-alpha or tumor necrosis factor alpha, can directly kill the cells. And opposite to all of these inflammatory effects, we also have an anti-inflammatory cytokine that will wind down the immune response. Is that clear for everyone? All right. Now, cytokine signaling can occur through multiple different pathways. First of all, we have an autocrine. You guys have probably taken this in endorepro, but autocrine from the word auto is where you stimulate the same cell. So it secretes cytokines to stimulate itself. A paracrine is something that is to the nearby cell, something that is for your neighbor. So paracrine is for your, I'm trying to, figure out a way to make you guys remember this one but parrots like to fly i guess paracrine to nearby cells all right an endocrine function is what you guys took all about with hormones where you get secreted into the bloodstream and they travel and they go to a distant cell but when that happens when you go to a distant cell sometimes you're going to have stimulation and recruitment of that cell, right? So you're going to tell that cell, okay, I, I need you here. Please come to me. Like, this is where things are happening. I, I need you to come here. And this is basically how extravasation works, where macrophages are going to recognize the invasive proteins. And then as a result of the engagement of their PRRs, they will become stimulated to produce and release inflammatory cytokines and mediators, including chemokines. These chemokines are going to get diffused out of the tissue and go into the circulation. And then the leukocytes that are in the blood vessels and the lymphatics will kind of sniff out these cytokines and they are drawn to where the highest concentration of the chemokines are. So usually in our body, we have something going from the area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration, right? But in the case of lymphocytes, they recognize that, okay, wherever this cytokine is being released the most, is probably where I have this problem. So this extravasation is when we recruit those lymphocytes to the site where we have the highest concentration of these cytokines. Is that clear? Perfect. Now for the actual cytokines. Most people would just tell you, oh, well, those are what they are, just memorize them. But I would not do that to you guys. So I will try my absolute best to try to make this make sense. It's not really going to make sense much and you will have to memorize them, but try to like follow along with me. So let's think of a B cell's best friend, the neutrophil, which is a granulocyte. How old was our neutrophil? All right, and how old was her best friend? 
the neutrophil was 15, but how old was her best friend, the macrophage? All right. So since we have those two numbers, I want you guys to take out the one, right? We're, we're going to have four and five and six. And I want you to remember that the neutrophil is a granulocyte. And with the family of granulocytes, we have our eosinophil and our mast cells, which E for eosinophil, I told you guys, IgE, will be secreted when we have either allergy or a parasitic infection. So when we have interleukin, IL is for interleukin, interleukin-4, interleukin-5, or interleukin-6, we are going to stimulate IgE production in a parasitic infection. And our neutrophil is our B cell's best friend. So she will stimulate her and she will try to make her grow and try to make her develop and try to make her the best version of herself that she can be. So interleukin four, five, and six, remember our B cell, her best friend, the neutrophil, her friend, the macrophage, and the neutrophil sisters, the mast cell, and the eosinophil. Is that okay? All right. If you guys don't really understand these connections, it's completely fine. It's not actually relevant to the lecture. I'm just trying to make it easier to memorize. All right. Now, 2 and beta are almost always healers. They always try to fix something. They always try to look around for what they can help with. And then 10 wants you to have a 10 out of 10 health. So a beta, TGF beta, or specifically transforming growth factor beta from the name with IL-10, which wants you to be a 10 out of 10, are going to be anti-inflammatory and they will stimulate wound repair. So TGF beta, anti-inflammatory, interleukin 10, 10 out of 10, wound repair. And I told you beta and 2 always want to heal you. So interleukin 2 will be for proliferation, mainly of our T cells. So interleukin-2 is also our T cell growth factor. Think of it basically as we have our CD3 and our CD4. What's right before that? CD2. Or like interleukin-2, I mean like the number two. Now for interleukin-7, I'm sorry, this is confusing. It's how my brain works, okay? I'm trying. Interleukin-7 is very religious, okay? It's very Islamic. We have the seven layers of, of hell, seven layers of Jannah, the seven, you know, like seven everything. There's seven everywhere. So seven is for proliferation. Seven is where we're going to have a lot of growth, right? When we focus more on our religion, we grow as people, and this is why we stimulate proliferation. So interleukin-2, two, 2 and beta are always for healing. 2 for CD3, CD4. So it is a T cell growth factor. And interleukin-7, religious, you are growing as a person. So it is for proliferation. TGF beta, beta once again, anti-inflammatory. Interleukin-10, 10, 10 out of 10, wound repair. Is that clear? What is the difference between inflammatory and pro-inflammatory? Well, good for you. We are just about to get to those. Good job. Pro-inflammatory is something that stimulates the release of inflammatory cytokines. So it will not stimulate the inflammation per se, but it will stimulate the release of the factors that will cause the inflammation. So with regards to our pro-inflammatory and our inflammatory, I want you guys to remember our inflammasome, where I told you guys we have interleukin-1 and interleukin-18. 
So 18 is the number that we will be looking after here. It's the number that we will be trying to reach. So we have 17 plus one and six plus 12, all right? 12 plus six and 17 plus one will all give me 18, which is part of the inflammasome. So this is for inflammation. And then I told you alpha, I told you, sorry, beta is always for healing. Alpha will be for destruction and gamma will be for destruction. So beta is just sandwiched between alpha and gamma, which want to destroy things. Now, pro-inflammatory and actually inflammatory, you guys just have to know that you sort them out into IL-12, IL-17, and interferon gamma, which will stimulate cells to actually secrete IL-1, IL-6, and TNF-alpha. I cannot stress enough how important those three are. So interleukin-1, interleukin-6, and TNF-alpha. Very briefly again, very quickly, the stories that I told you guys about, our B cell's best friend will, will have 14, 15, 16, so four, five, six. The neutrophils sisters are our eosinophil and mast cells, eosinophil for IgE, parasitic infections. So antibody proliferation, which is IgE specifically. And then interleukin 10, 10 out of 10 for wound repair and beta, for anti-inflammatory, interleukin-2 for CD3, CD4, T cell growth factor for proliferation, IL-7 when you grow as a person religiously, proliferation, and then 12 and 6, 17 and 1, all equal 18, which is part of our inflammasome, which is for inflammation. And then gamma and alpha are both going to stimulate inflammation rather than beta, which will stimulate healing. Interferon gamma will be pro-inflammatory and TNF alpha will be inflammatory. Interferon gamma is also very involved with natural killer cell stimulation. And so you can also imagine how this will stimulate something that will come and induce the inflammation itself. Is that clear for everyone? Do you guys understand the functions well? Do you feel like this might be a bit easier to memorize now? All right. Perfect. Now, aside from cytokines, we also have what is known as chemokines, which is part of the previous lecture. Now we can finally get to them because chemokines are a large family of structurally homologous cytokines. They don't understand why I'd give you chemokines when you don't know what cytokines are, but it's fine. So chemokines are a subset of cytokines that all contain disulfide bonds or disulfide loops. You don't have to worry much about the detail or the structures, but what you do need to know is that neutrophils are recruited by CXC, monocytes by CC chemokines, and lymphocytes by both CC and CXC. Now, what, does, what do those mean? It basically means that you have your cysteine here, your cysteine here, and then another type of amino acid in the middle. Here, you just have two cysteines. Does that make sense? All right, so our chemokines classified into four families based on the number and the location of the N-terminal cysteine, but that's not something that actually really matters. And they're basically, the CC and CXC are the subfamilies that are produced by the leukocytes and by several types of tissue cells, such as endothelial cells, epithelial cells, fibroblasts. And in many of these cells, the chemokine secretion is due to activation by PRRs following encounter with microbes. Chemokines are not only induced by this activation of PRRs, but also by inflammatory cytokines. Do you guys remember what our inflammatory cytokines were that I just mentioned? Think of the smaller numbers that will give me the sums of 18.
IL-6. CNF Alpha and IL-1. Yes, perfect. You guys got all of them. Wonderful job. All right. We also have under cytokines what is known as interferons. Interferons were basically first discovered to interfere or block virus replication. And this is why they are called interferons. Um, one of you, all right, there we go. <laughs> all right. So interferons are divided into different major groups. Type one is classical antiviral interferon, which is made up of two members, interferon alpha and interferon beta, all right? Interferon beta has been used to, I told you guys beta is always for healing. So interferon beta has been used to cure, prevent, and reduce the severity of multiple sclerosis and control hepatitis C virus infections. You don't have to know the details, but just know that interferon beta is usually something that helps in healing. Now type two only has one member, which is interferon gamma. And if you guys remember, interferon gamma in our table was pro-inflammatory. And it is thought of as being predominantly an immune modulating cytokine, but it also is known to have a negative regulation by blocking the replication of some viruses. So it has some antiviral effects. Type three is something that you guys won't really be seeing much, but they are antiviral interferons. And the reason why they're called interferons, even though they're interleukins, is because they interfere with viral rep replication again, all right? So we have interleukin-28 and interleukin-29. How high yield is this? Not very, in my opinion, but just remember them for the sake of your exam. Okay. Now to look into the actual inflammatory and inflammation resolve processes, we will have engagement of PRRs. We're here. Okay, engagement of PRRs engagement of FC receptors, or engagement of complement receptors, all of which are going to activate NF-kappa B in macrophages, which basically induces proliferation. And this activates the secretion of inflammatory cytokines like interleukin-1, interleukin-6, and TNF-alpha. Once that happens, we will secrete all of those factors that stimulate our inflammation. So. We either stimulate PRRs using PAMPs, we stimulate complement receptors using our C3B and C4B, or we stimulate our FC receptor using an antibody that is opsonized on our pathogen. All of those will lead to secretion of inflammatory cytokines by the macrophage. Is that clear for you guys? All right, so let's take a look at the three that I told you guys are very important. Again, I'm just gonna put them here for the sake of making sure that you guys know them. The interleukin-1, TNF-alpha, and interleukin-6 are the three key inflammatory cytokines. Interleukin-1 has two isoforms, alpha and beta. You don't have to know the details of that, but it was in the slides, so I thought I'd include it. Interleukin 1 alpha is produced in macrophages following PRR engagement. Interleukin 1 beta is a, is a dimogen, which is the one that we were talking about in our inflammasome. TNF alpha is tumor necrosis factor alpha. So it causes this necrosis or this death pathway primarily to our tumors or our cancer cells. Now our interleukin-6, it's recognized as a key inflammatory cytokine that is associated with many immunopathologic diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, like COVID. And so we try to block the cytokine using monoclonal antibodies to the IL-6, which I told you guys about, remember, monoclonal antibodies that get produced. And by doing so, there has been a benefit that's shown to decrease this chronic inflammation. This is more of a therapeutic aspect to it because interleukin-6 in excess might also still have somewhat of an anti-inflammatory effect. So 
Interleukin-6 is a bit confusing, and because of that, they try their best to produce monoclonal antibodies that will block it off in order to prevent the stimulation of this chronic inflammation and to prevent this role of rheumatoid arthritis and COVID-19 in immunopathologic diseases. Does that make sense? All right. On the other end of the spectrum, we have our anti-inflammatory factors, which result in the resolution of inflammation. So once the inflammatory response has been generated, we need to wind it down. And this comes through the production of two anti-inflammatory cytokines, interleukin-10 and TGF-beta. I told you guys interleukin-10, 10, 10 out of 10 for wound repair, and TGF-beta for anti-inflammation. All right. Is that clear for everyone? All right. Now, this point about they are inactivators of the complement is basically where you have negative regulatory factors that can either dissociate the active complement from forming into the membrane attack complex or our MACPAN, or they can actually degrade the various complement components before they can even go into the cascade. And through that, you guys remember how we had, wait, I'll just open the slide again. Here, we had our complement that is going to activate the complement receptors on a macrophage to release this inflammatory cytokine. So if we prevent these complements from even being there to begin with, we prevent the complement cascade, we prevent this activation, and they also promote immune cell suppression, which leads to wound healing. All right, that brings us to the end of this lecture. You guys have gone through a lot so far. If you would like us to take a short break before the last lecture, that is completely fine by me. One point that I do want to mention, though, is that in immunology, a lot of the things that we know come from realizing what the lack of something gives us rather than what the presence of something does. So this is exemplified in the thymus, for example, where they had nude mice that lacked any hair. That's why they're called nude mice that lacked a thymus. And so essentially they were just like the prime example of what a completely immunocompromised person is. And they'd use those mice to try to discover what would happen if you lack T lymphocytes. They did some pretty awful experiments where they would take a graft and like of cancer and put it into that mouse. And then they'd realize that the mouse did not have any sort of reaction to it whatsoever. And all of those experiments are just the beginning of our understanding of the immune system. And there's so much more that we have no idea what anything is about. And that's why I'm telling you guys that, for example, like interleukin-6, they're not sure why it works, but they know it works. So they just use it anyway. And yes, that brings us to the end of this lecture. You guys have any questions? I know this lecture is somewhat heavy, but I really, really, really hope that I was able to simplify it as much as possible for you guys. Would you guys like us to take a five minute break or should we keep going to the next lecture? Break, okay. Five minute break, yeah, that makes sense, all right. So we will be back at, thing is now that it's 4.41, I'm not going to tell you guys to come back at 4.46, am I? So we'll come back at 4.50, so a nine minute break. Uh, you guys can go rest for a bit, grab a snack or something. And in the meantime, I will be here to answer any of your questions. Uh, so please just brainstorm anything that you guys need. 
I'll open the slide with the table for everything. If you guys want to review that and look at that and tell me if you have any questions from it. And then we will resume, inshallah, at 4.50 sharp. All right. So let us move on to the third and final lecture in our session for today, which is lecture nine, T helper cell subsets. Now, remember how I told you guys that when a T helper cell interacts with a macrophage, after all of this adhesion happens, the macrophage is going to start to release cytokines, right? This was before this naive T cell had even fully developed into an effector T cell. This macrophage or this professional antigen presenting cell that the T helper cell is going to interact with is going to release cytokines that lead to the differentiation of a T helper cell into various different subsets. My voice is lagging. Is that happening for anyone else? It sounds like a skill issue, oh my guy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> not happening to anyone else then I'll keep going if there's any issues that arise during just let me know and I'll I'll try to find a solution all right so as a T helper cell emerges from the thymus it's naive it has not yet been exposed to any antigen but not only that it is also not yet subtyped it is not yet a specific subgroup and because of that, it is going to be called a TH0 cell. So as a result of the action of an antigen presenting cell, this directly cell-mediated immune response is going to make this TH0 type of cell differentiate into another subset based on the cytokines that are released by the antigen presenting cell, usually a macrophage. If this antigen presenting cell releases interleukin 12, we will have the differentiation of a Th0 cell into a Th1 T helper cell. If we have the secretion of TGF beta, we will have the differentiation into a Th17 cell or a T regulatory cell. Lastly, if we have the secretion of an interleukin-4 by macrophages, we will have the differentiation into a Th2 cell. This seems like a lot, but it's basically our body's way of knowing which type of response to actually use. So the body is constantly receiving a bunch of different signals. The body is constantly being exposed to a plethora of aggressors ranging from bacteria, parasites, all the way to intracellular viruses. So how does the immune system know which type of immune recognition to, mo to mobilize, right? The antigen presenting cell, since it is the first cell that sees that antigen, is going to identify it and process it and know what kind of immune response to launch against it. As it processes that antigen, this entire cascade happens. We will have either even mast cell degranulation, histamine release, activation of eosinophils, recruitment of T cells, all of those things can happen just based on the antigen presenting cells response. Now, these T reg cells or our regulatory T cells are not necessarily considered a subtype of T helper cells, but they are what regulate the function of the rest of the T helper cells subtypes, okay? So you induce peripheral tolerance that control the actions of Th1, Th2, and Th17. To take a closer look at each of these, we can see this diagram. Th2 cells and Th17 cells are more associated with barrier functions. So you'll see that they're highly prevalent within the GI tract, as well as the skin, the respiratory tract. And there is an interplay between all three types of cells, where the cytokines produced by one cell are going to inhibit the cytokines that stimulate another cell, so that this type of T cell is the one that is going to predominate, and it's the one that we need in that specific response. So in this way, the cell-mediated immune system can then focus on one type of action, right? 
So looking at that here, we have our antigen presenting cell that will secrete interleukin-12 to stimulate us to produce Th1. Th1 will then act on macrophages to make them into what is called M1, and I'll get that I'll get to that in a second. Or they will secrete interferon gamma, which will stimulate B cells to undergo class switching from IgM to IgG and to undergo what is known as an inflammatory process, let's say. So Th1 is primarily an inflammatory type of T helper cell. Th2 will come from the degranulation of a mast cell. And when I say mast cell, you guys can start to imagine, okay, so I have allergies, I have parasites, I have a type 1 hypersensitivity sort of reaction, hypersensitivity is lecture 12, which we'll be covering next time, but just know that th this is a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction, okay? So when we have this mast cell degranulating, we will secrete interleukin-4, which will simulate the naive T cell that we have to class switch into TH2 or T helper cell class 2. This T helper cell class 2 will secrete three cytokines. So for TH1, we just had interferon gamma. So think of the one for interferon as the one for TH1. TH2 will secrete three different types. It will secrete the interleukin 4 that was used to stimulate it, and it will secrete interleukin 13 and interleukin 5. The interleukin-4 will act on B cells for them to class switch from IgM to IgE instead, the E, eosinophils, parasites, unlike in Th1, where it stimulates them to transform to IgG. Interleukin-5 will act on the eosinophils to make them degranulate and on epithelial cells to make them produce mucus in order to fight this sort of allergic reaction. So think of an allergic reaction. Think of a parasitic infection. When I increase the mucous membrane barrier, when I increase this viscosity, let's say, I'm going to trap this parasite, right? Or, or this allergen. When that happens, I need eosinophils to degranulate, and then I need IgE-mediated immunity in order to stimulate the full response. So all of those things happen through the cytokines released by our Th2 cell. Th17 cells are also associated with a barrier function but they are mainly for extracellular pathogens and autoimmune disorders. So Th17 is very frequently associated with autoimmune disorders, especially when they are in excess. So we have interleukin-6 and TGF-beta that will stimulate us to change our naive T cell into Th17. This Th17 will secrete interleukin-17, finally one that makes sense, which will stimulate our macrophages and our neutrophils. Is that clear? I know it's a lot. No? Or is that from before? Oh no, that was from before, I think. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Would anyone like me to repeat this again? I'll be going over each cell type now again, but does this image make sense? All right, perfect. Okay. So once again, just to stress to you guys, the cytokines that are produced by these cells will inhibit the cytokines that stimulate other types of cells. So this interferon gamma will block cytokine production of Th2 cells and the cytokines produced by Th2 cells will block the cytokine production by Th1 and Th17 cells so that you can get particular focusing of that cell-mediated immune response. Now, looking at Th1 cells alone, Th1 is an inflammatory cell type T helper cell subset, as I told you guys, and its major signature cytokine is interferon gamma. Interferon gamma is a pro-inflammatory cytokine that is going to then stimulate an inflammatory cytokine to be released, and it has so many different functions, including activating macrophages to increase phagocytosis, including like 
uh, production of CD40, CD40 ligand, and, and so many other things, like activating B cells to switch to opsonizing antibodies like IgG, all of those things I've written down for you guys in the notes section so you can look into. But very briefly to mention them, it's going to stimulate class 2 MUC expression. It will stimulate B7 co-stimulation expression. It will suppress TH2 and T17 differentiation, all of which are things that are going to help proliferate more T helper cells. And at the same time, prevent the class switching of these T helper cells into other types of T helper cells like class 2 and 17. It will also activate the B cell, as I told you guys, to switch to IgG, which we know is an opsonizing antibody. So it tags our pathogen to take to a macrophage for it to get opsonized or eaten up. Some very important function that it has is that it will activate macrophages by CD40, CD40 ligand interactions. Remember how I told you guys the CD40, CD40 ligand interaction, if it does not happen, we cannot have B7. So looking at a macrophage, it can only happen, it, it can only be activated when you have both interferon gamma and CD40, CD40 ligand interaction. Once that happens, this macrophage is going to get stimulated to go ahead and perform its function and kill the cells that it needs to and phagocytize the cells that it needs to. And particularly when I'm talking about a Th1 cell, that is going to be my M1 macrophage. All right, so Th1, M1. What that means, I'll get to in a second. Is that clear for Th1? Now, TH2, remember how I told you 2 and beta are usually for healing? TH2 is usually something that, once again, will stimulate us to have a less sort of aggressive response, a less sort of killing type of response. But this is a phagocyte-independent immune response, where we had our mast cell degranulation, we had our IgE, we had our parasitic infection. So when we have parasites or allergens, we will stimulate our TH2. It will produce interleukin-4 that blocks the production of interferon gamma and the production of interleukin-17 from TH17. And it will promote the class switching of a B-cell antibody from IgM to IgE. This IgE, E for eosinophil, will stimulate our eosinophils, our basophils, our mast cells, which will secrete the three things that I told you guys about earlier, 4, 5, and 13 for TH2. All right? Now, interleukin-13 is basically going to have this blocking function where it increases mucus production, as I told you guys. And through that, this mucus will trap these helminths, these uh, allergens, and they will no longer be able to reach the mucus membrane. They will no longer be able to penetrate. Meanwhile, they will stimulate the activation of M2 macrophages, which are our other subset. And I told you two is for healing. So anti-inflammatory, thus TGF beta and interleukin. 10. Is that clear? I know I'm asking you guys like every two minutes at each slide, but I don't want us to move to anything if you don't understand the one that's before it. All right. Now I'm telling you guys about M1 and M2 macrophages. What do those mean? An M1 macrophage is the one that you think about where it's ready to come attack. It's ready to eat something up. It's ready to cause this inflammation. That is our M1 macrophage. It's going to secrete myeloperoxidase. It's going to form a phagolysosome. It's going to degrade things. It's going to eat up um, pathogens. The other part is our M2 macrophage that has basically non-inflammatory functions. And it purely phagocytoses things. It doesn't cause any inflammation. This is used more for wound repair. This is used more in our thymus, for example, where we just wanted to eat up 
and recycle those thymocytes that were non-functional. And in the production of interleukin-10 and TGF-beta, it has this wound healing effect rather than this destructive effect that our M1 macrophage has. Now, this seems like it's absolutely wonderful, right? We're like, oh, yeah, this one's the nice guy. This one seems like it's super evil. But you have to realize that it's different strokes for different folks. So when we have a helminthic infection, when we have a parasitic infection, and this parasite is trying to borrow into the mucosal barrier, obviously, you have to heal that barrier. But when you have a bacteria, we don't want to just like heal everything or build over this bacterial plaque, right? We want to actually kill that bacteria. We want to get rid of it before it gives us so many more complications. So each of these has their function. Each of these does something that is very important, but the main difference is inflammation or no inflammation. So an M1 macrophage will phagocytose with inflammation using phagolysosomes and myeloperoxidase. An M2 macrophage will phagocytose, but it will not cause any inflammation. Is that clear? Ten out of ten. All right. Lastly, the last cell type that we have is our Th17 cells. Th17 cells are once again involved in our mucosal barriers, but they are mainly against fungi and extracellular bacteria. These will stimulate the antigen-presenting cells to make interleukin-1, interleukin-6, and interleukin-23, all of which will stimulate the class switching of a Th0 cell to a Th17 cell. A signature cytokine that is produced by this Th17 cell is interleukin-17, and this causes an acute inflammation that acts as a chemoattractant for other types of cells. So neutrophils, macrophages, they're all going to come and run to the site of action. They're going to realize, oh, something is wrong. Th17 cells also are going to make interleukin-22. This promotes epithelial membrane integrity. You guys, I don't think I've done fungi yet, if I'm not mistaken. But fungi, specifically if we're talking about mold, have this thing where they really like to branch out and spread out. And they make this like tree sort of meshwork, let's say. So if I can prevent them from having an opening to even produce that sort of effect, that's going to save me a lot of trouble, right? So through interleukin-22, I will promote epithelial membrane integrity. And I will prevent this fungi or this extracellular bacteria from passing through our membrane. So Th2 cells did that as well by increasing the mucus stimulation. Furthermore, Th17 cells are going to stimulate the production of antimicrobial peptides like defensins, and these will directly kill the bacteria and the fungi. So it's similar in a sense to how cytotoxic T cells will release their inflammatory cytokines and kill those cells, but here we will have defensins, which will kill those cells. Now, we spoke about Th2 and Th17 cells and, and that they're like more for protecting us and more for healing. But when Th2 and Th17 cells get upregulated and they're, get, they're unregulated, let's say, because I told you guys they're specific to the mucosal areas, they can start to cause serious GI tract diseases like chronic bowel syndrome, Crohn's disease, and several inflammatory diseases like multiple sclerosis, inflammatory bowel disease, and rheumatic arthritis that I told you guys are associated with TH17. So everything in our immune system needs to be very closely regulated. Looking at a summary of our three types of cells, we have our Th0, our naive T cell, that will get stimulated into becoming a Th1 cell, a Th2 cell, or a Th17 cell. What makes this differentiate into Th1? Can you guys remember? Interleukin-12, perfect. I was not expecting that. I'm very impressed, Michelle. What makes them move to Th2 cells? Interleukin-4, amazing. And what makes them go to Th17 cells? 
23, amazing job. All right, so here we have, and six, yes, good job. So here we have our Th1, signature cytokine is interferon gamma. Our Th2, signature cytokines are four, five, and 13. And Th17, signature cytokine is 17, but also we have 22. Th1 will activate macrophages, specifically our M1, and produce class switching of B cells antibodies from IgM to IgG, which acts as an opsonin. For Th2, it will act on the mast cells and eosinophils for degranulation and activation. It will cause a class switching of antibodies from IgM to IgE, and it will cause alternative macrophage activation into M2. Th17 will act on neutrophils and monocyte macrophages to recruit them to the site of action. Th1 cells act against intracellular microbes, while Th17 act on extracellular microbes and fungi. Th2 are unique in that they fight helminthic parasites and are allergic to al uh, are <laughs> allergic to associated with allergic diseases. Th1 is associated with tissue damage and chronic infections, and Th17 is autoimmune inflammatory diseases. Is that clear for everyone? Yes, <laughs> okay. Now, we have this table here that when I was studying personally, I was like, oh yeah, I know everything here, except those, and there's no way we're gonna get a question on those. Guess what happened? Ha ha, this exact one we got as a question. Thankfully, I remembered it, but it seems like it's very low yield, but I like encourage you guys to remember those. That's why I highlighted them in a different color. So once again, this is just a summary slide. CD4 positive T cell becomes Th1 through in interleukin 12 and interferon gamma, which will produce interferon gamma, flow inflammatory macrophages, and it's controlled by the transcription factor Tbet. Th2 is stimulated by interleukin 4. It will produce interleukin 4, 5, and 13, and it will have an immune response to helminths through eosinophils, mast cells, and IgE, and it's controlled by GATA3. Th17 is stimulated by interleukin 23 and 6, as you guys mentioned, but focus more on 23. It produces interleukin 17 and 22, which has a mucosal barrier function. And it will respond by an acute inflammatory response by recruiting neutrophils and macrophages. It is controlled by the transcription factor ROR gamma T. T regulatory cells, which you don't have to focus too much on, but know this one just in case are stimulated by interleukin-2. They produce interleukin-10 and TGF-beta. They are anti-inflammatory to antigen-presenting cells, T cells, B cells, and natural killer cells. They're controlled by the transcription factor FOXP3. Now, I told you guys about the innate immune system. I told you guys about the adaptive immune system. But the thing is that we have a place where they intertwine. We have these types of cells that just stay in between and you're not sure if they're innate, you're not sure if they're adaptive. Can you guys try to remember any that I've potentially spoken about that might fit into this? Natural killer cells, perfect. Any other? Okay, when I was telling you guys, <laughs> oh, it's not there. When I was telling you guys about our T cells, I told you that their T cell receptor is formed from alpha beta. But I told you guys that there is a different subset that is formed of two different subunits that are called. Gamma delta. Okay, so our natural killer cells are part of this intertwined innate adaptive immune system. Our gamma delta T helper cells, which you guys don't have to focus on, are also part of that. And finally, we have our innate lymphoid cells. 
for ILC 1, 2, and 3. There's still a lot of ongoing research about these types of cells. We don't know much about them, but their functions are basically similar to Th1, Th2, and Th17 in the sense that ILC1 will secrete interferon gamma and produce cytokines that are associated with Th1 type responses to viral and intracellular bacterial antigens. ILC2 will produce interleukin-5 and interleukin-13 to protect from parasitic infections. And ILC3 will produce interleukin-17 that is important in combating extracellular bacteria and fungi, and it's found in mucosal sites. So what the difference between these and our usual T helper cells is that they don't necessarily express CD4 or CD3, and they don't come from a lymphoid origin. However, they do produce very similar functions and they are somewhat innate. Natural killer cells are related to cytotoxic T cells. They're important in killing virus infected cells. They're important in killing tumor cells. And they produce interleukin-12, which activates macrophages to produce interferon gamma that I told you guys is important in natural killer cells. Is that clear? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So very briefly again about these, they are innate lymphoid cells that are fixed in the tissue. They don't have a T cell receptor. They don't express CD3. So they don't produce these cytokines as a result of antigen presentation or antigen recognition. We don't really know how these cells are activated, but what we do know is that when these cells see a particular pathogen within that localized tissue, they will produce interferon gamma, IL-5 or IL-17, and then that will direct them to activate the classical Th1, Th2, Th17 cells to come and make more of these cytokines. And with that, we reach the end of our third lecture. Any questions about any of the lectures so far? I told you guys that immuno post midterm is somewhat heavier. So I apologize if this was a lot. Hopefully everything was clear enough. I really, really hope that you guys benefited from the session. I hope that this was helpful and you have a better understanding of everything. Do you have any questions at all about any of the three lectures that we've just covered, lecture seven, eight, and nine? All right, perfect. Okay, please scan this QR code, you guys, to give me your feedback. I'd really appreciate if you guys filled this out. It shouldn't take up too much of your time. And it's not for me personally, but I'd appreciate hearing you guys' feedback. I tried my best to make the slides the way that you guys said you like them, where I included mainly text in the slide itself and then some of you said you liked the only pictures, so I mixed and matched between both to hopefully please everyone. But if you could please scan this QR code, I'd really, really appreciate it. I sincerely hope this session was beneficial for you all. I hope that everything has been cleared up. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. because these lectures are very, very high yield. So please make sure that you're very familiar with them. <laughs>